everybody. Welcome back to the Be That Lawyer with Bretson podcast. We are rocking and rolling twice a week to help you be that lawyer, confident, organized, and a skilled rainmaker. Oh, man. Um, it's Summer's wrapping up rapidly here in Chicago. Um, we're not getting the heat like some other places, but we're having some good some good golf weather. Uh, Phil, you uh, getting your rounds in? I'm getting. I've got a, a goal of 40 rounds a season, and I'm okay. on track for this year, so I should, it should be another good. I just wish the golf is that, would... Is that a business goal or a personal goal? What is that? Yes, all of the above. <laughs> I love it. I played Dubs Dread uh, last weekend, and Ooh. that just that that took 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 the life right out of me. That is a rough course. <laughs> was that number three? Number four. Number so Cock Hill number four is Dubs Dread, um, and I and I dreaded most of it. Um, <laughs> it's right there in the name, right? So you know, I feel like it should be a course in Jamaica. I'm not sure why Dubs Dread. Um, but uh, what's, what's the what's the coolest course you played in uh, the summer? Ooh. Oh, the hardest course I played was Aurora Country Club. Okay. They had greens that were running really quick. And there was one that, you know, uphill, if you didn't put the ball in the hole, it would come back further than your first ball. Yeah, I've played those courses. <laughs> that, yeah, that takes that takes the life right out of you, right? When it you, does. you had a good putt and then you missed by an inch, but it ends up being 10 feet. So I'm not uh, going back there. Okay, that's that. All right. Sorry to the people of Aurora. Um Phil, so great to have you back on the show. We were trying to figure out if this was your second or third time. Either way, every time you come on, it's magic. We uh, we we always have great conversations. Um, I want to start off with our quote of the show, which is um, our good old friend, um, who's that, Peter Drucker, probably, right? Culture yep. eats strategy for breakfast. That's something people have heard quite a bit. Um, talk about uh, that quote, and welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Good to be back. You know, it I'm a real big culture guy when I work with clients. You know, it's one thing to have a strategy and a vision and all those good things. But if your culture doesn't support what you're trying to accomplish, you're never going to get there. Yeah. And, you know, to me, culture is everything. How you do what you do is the biggest indicator of whether you're going to be successful. Or not. Yeah. And, you know, people um, working with a new client, there are 250 people. And the initial meeting, you know, they like, you know, we don't have anything out there for our people. It's just kind of evolved. And, you know, the, the meeting actually started by a problem employee that turned to it. We have to start at the beginning. Said, yes, it's the better place to start. Where are you going and how are you going to get there? And the how part is, to me, more important than the where are you going. Yeah. The how and the who. Yep. And the why. Wow. All good questions. That's it. You know, it. But it, when people, you know, get those right, that's your your like your twin north star is where you're going and how you're going to get there. The the challenge you're going to counter along the way, you use those. Hey, you know, vision wise is what we want to do in line with that vision. Yes or no? If yeah. it is, probably a good chance you should be doing it. If not, probably a good chance you shouldn't be doing it. And then culture wise, who's fitting? You know, you may have a high producer, but if they're being detrimental to the culture of the organization. Can they stay? No. They either have yeah. to get with it or get out. Yeah. And I do know this from experience that everybody else, you know, sits up a little bit straighter and goes, oh, my God, they're actually serious about this stuff. And when you get serious, you get people engaged at a higher level. Yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, ch not changing the subject completely, but that that quota has been twisted around a bunch. And, and the one that I picked up on was discipline eats motivation for breakfast when I'm talking about individual efforts of, of people on business development. And that's my most recent above the law article. If you guys want to search that on above the law, just type in my name in the, in the uh, magnifying glass box or whatever, but it's, it's, you know, lawyers can't get where they want to go. Just, just being motivated. They've got to have the discipline to execute. And I think that could go to culture that could go to business development that could go to um, creating processes and just never putting them in place because you don't have the discipline to either hire someone to do it or the discipline to do it yourself, whatever that might be. But it, that, that quota has been moved around quite a bit over the years. And, and with good reason, it's a, it's a, it's a fun and easy way to kind of take in different variations. Without a doubt. And you're right on track. You know, the discipline starts, you know, leadership starts with self-leadership. If you can learn how to lead you, it's a whole lot easier to lead others and lead organizations. Yeah. But it is that, you know, do what you need to be doing. Yeah. All right on. Yeah, right on. You guys, you're listening to Phil Gafka here on the Fretzen Talk Show. No, um, Chief Cook and <laughs> Bottle Washer at Leap Coaching. Um, and you've been, you've been, we we've known each other a long time, and you're you're just 
this coach that that um, can take a CEO, can take an executive, and really get them in line with what they're doing. Give us a little background because that's not that's not where you started. Take us to how you how you came to be. Well, I spent uh, about thirty years in the appliance distribution business. The first company I was with twenty three years went from sales up to running the organization. And being a wholesale distributor, we were involved with products like Sub Zero, Viking Range, Thermator, High End appliances for the kitchen and calling on other businesses exclusively, you start to see why does business A always do well? Why does business B always struggle? What are those foundational elements that are or are not in place that help organizations, you know, be successful, you know, more times than not? Yeah. And left after 23 years, left that company, started another company with Viking distributor or Viking in the Midwest, uh, ran that for five years. And again, you know, doubled the business and learned a lot more about how to lead an organization and not try to manage it. And that's some of the magic I see with the better run organizations out there. They're not, you manage process, you lead people. It's two different disciplines. And the organizations that understand the leadership part of what they need to do versus just the management part are the ones that can truly align their people and get to where they want to go or get a lot closer. Yeah, it's mostly the law firm managers that are wearing, and even solos that are wearing, you know, half a dozen hats, right? They're leading, they're managing, they're selling, they're producing, they're administrating, marketing. And it's very, very challenging for them to be successful. That's not, when you look at the formula of a successful company, there's very few where, yeah, it's one guy that, or one gal that's like doing every role in that company successfully, right? That I, I I would love to hear that story of someone that was successful that way because it hasn't come up. No, and I think, you know, when you're looking at those professional services, you know, I, I, I do work with attorneys in those managing partner roles and they tell them, I hate your title because you're yeah. thinking like a manager. You yeah. need to think like a leader. And again, just what you said, You know, the leader doesn't have to do everything. There's important things to be done, but it's not important that the leader does all those things. So how do you build a team? How do you engage other people? You know, and the team is what's going to be successful, not necessarily just that individual, but it is a mindset. Yeah. And there's challenges that every organization faces, whether it's Google or Apple or the local law firm up the street. Um, What are you seeing as sort of the top, cultural challenges that affect their ability to be successful? Well, these days, there's a couple of main ones. Uh, Great question. One is that this is the first time in our history we've had five generations in the workforce and trying to align five different value structures, not right or wrong, just different value structures. Each generation has been brought up under different socioeconomic world political events. And there's no right or wrong. I mean, millennials take a big hit, but you know, I think every older generation picks on the younger generation beneath them. Well, and is again, that because is that because Gen X is best? I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> I, I was kind of prone to both baby boomers myself. Oh, uh, you know, shoot. Okay, but you know, that's the thing. It's 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 learning how do you leverage what each of those generations brings to the game. And how do you, you know, create cross-generational teams within an organization so they can each learn from one another? And how do you make sure you're using those assets that they all bring? You know, not just the generational thing, but, you know, these days you throw in DE&I, you throw in LGBTQ, you throw in Black Lives Matter, and you have either a recipe for success, if you can do it correctly, or you got a recipe for disaster. Yeah. And that's where that culture part comes in. So, you know, so importantly that you're not trying to create a culture that every single individual, you know, that it's their culture. You're trying to create one that like, like, like your DNA, 23 points. You're not going to get all 23. What are the most important ones that you have to match for that employee to be a good mix and a good match for your culture? You can get those bigger things correct. You can do a lot of great things. Then you're talking about alignment and you're talking about actively engaged employees. Yeah. So what are some of the, if you don't mind kind of walking everybody through what, how you're seeing 
the value of each generation. And maybe we start from, from the top down, from the boomers down of what, what's the value of the boomer in the organization? What's the value of the gen? Let's just kind of go down let's keep, we'll keep it positive because we could talk about the failings <laughs> of those, right? That's a, that's a different, that's maybe another show, another half hour, but let's just talk about the attributes, the, the positive attributes. Well, let's, okay. We'll start with the traditionalists, okay. which are that, you know, you've got 75, 80, 80, 85 year olds in the workforce. Still. Look at Rupert Murdoch. Okay. And they bring a different level of experience. I mean, they're a small part of the market, a couple percent maybe, but they bring a, a vast knowledge and experience base. They bring a sense of history and they bring a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. When you get down to boomers, you know, we were boomers at their height were 80 million strong. And you you were coming into a time of rapid expansion for technologies, for industries, you know, and they I'll just segue, you know, they they hit on millennials about being, you know, not loyal, not sticking around. Actually, the first job hoppers were baby boomers because of all these expanding technologies and industries. And they bring, you know, a lot of structure, top down. I'm not saying it's necessarily good, but they bring a lot of that, that structure to an organization. What the millennials or the Gen Xers brought, and they were only 40 million strong, so they really couldn't go toe to toe with those 80 million boomers, but they brought a different way. They brought a different level of technology. They brought a different understanding of life. They were exposed to many different things growing up, you know, different sets of wars, different sets of economies. And they brought a, a different idea of, okay, how do we do these things? And it was not that same kind of structure. The millennials took it even a step further. And I don't, I won't say they rebelled, but when they had another, you know, they're 80 million strong, they can go toe to toe with any of these other groups. And so their influence Technology wise, you're seeing it in the millennials and the Gen Zs with the work life balance. I mean, they saw the, the, the us boomers spend their whole lives dedicated to a job, missing out on family things because they had to, you know, had to take care of that job and be that professional. And you know what? They've seen there's a better way to do this. And they want that work life balance. And so they're starting to show that. You know, the people that are still those boomers in the organization, then you know what? It's not a just about put your nose down you know, and, and hit the grindstone. It's have some fun along the way. Mm -hmm. And again, the technology that they've grown up with, you know, what I grew up with, we had a transistor radio. Yeah. You know, some of these younger generations, they've had three, four, five different methods of delivering information and music to themselves. I had one. And they're used to this constant change of what's next, what's new, versus my generation that was, you know, hey, we had what we had and we may do with it. Yeah. But you're looking at this rapid change in technology and then throw AI into the mix and how each generation is learning how to use AI and be more productive and be more efficient. It's just that, you know, these are strange things to boomers. Unfortunately, we're on our way out. And it's going to be up to these next, you know, three generations to figure out how they're going to balance their differences. Again, we're not talking right or wrong, but when they talk about millennials, as an example, you know, not being loyal. When millennials grew up, divorce was at an all-time high, as was corporate downsides. So yeah, mom and dad work hard, you know, put their nose down, and all of a sudden we're out of a job. So what did millennials learn about loyalty? They learned look out for number one. Now is that wrong? No, that's what they experienced. That's what they grew up with. We just have to be able to balance that with how do you put together an organization that acknowledges the differences and learns how to use those differences and put them together in a neat little package versus, you know, turning a blind eye and hoping that things will work out. It's really talking about how do you get through conflict? those different generations, those different ideas of how to accomplish things. How do you learn how to talk to one another? How do you learn how to actively listen? And again, this is this manager versus leader mindset. The manager who has the title, you know, I'll make the decision. That's that top down. The leader is more concerned with, let's talk about the best decision. Don't care whose it is. 
let's just get the best decisions and let's go implement and execute on those. And the organizations that are doing this, it's not age related, it's going for the best. Yeah. And I, I'm hearing a lot of, you know, buzzing around the legal in the legal space about, you know, look, there's a work ethic that's necessary to bill hours. You know, that's the model that exists primarily in legal where, you know, you got to do your, you know, 1500 to 2000, you know, in some cases more hours a year in order to hit the numbers that are expected by the organization. That organization's culture might be amazing. It might be terrible, but, you know, that's the profit model that they have. And I think it definitely segregates people by generation in some ways, because some people are going to, you know, be up for that and, 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 you know, put their head down and others aren't. And um, I think it really puts a lot of strain on those organizations. Yeah. But that's, again, you know, if you get the, get the big things right. Okay. And I think most people understand, look, you don't take home a paycheck. You have to earn it. It's not a gift. And okay, here's how our firm earns our paychecks. This is how we do our business. And if you if you find the right people that understand that and say, yes, I can, and yes, I will. Okay, there's less fighting about you know what has to happen. But right. again, it's really more about their cultural fit. Here's how we do it. And I'll give you an yeah. example, and it wasn't a law, law example, but um, a young man I knew went to work for a big company and he went to school with high school with the CEO's son. And through that relationship and working there, he got an audience with the CEO. And the CEO said, we are a dog eat dog company. If you're not watching out for your hindquarters, nobody else is. No, I don't like it, but they were honest about it. And if you can live in that environment and you understand the ground rules, you'll do very well versus being a dog eat dog environment. And then they say, oh, we're like a family. We treat now and they give you the BS line. Well, then they're they're running, you know, they're saying something different than they're actually doing. Right. And getting that real clear clarity on here's where we're going. Here's how we're going to get there. Would you like to be part of this? Can you do this job? Will you do this job? If it's yes to both, it's great. When do you want to start? Right. But there's also, I mean, I'm also looking, it's more, I would say more small firms, but you know, look, I don't want to pick on the big firms either, but th that are saying, look, we don't want you to overwork yourself. We want you to take vacations. We have paternity leave and maternity leave. We have, you know, we we expect this work-life balance, um, you know, to happen for you because we want you to be loyal and we want you to be happy and we want you to work well and work hard, but also don't make that your whole life. Like we want you to have a family and, and spend time with the kids. Those cultures seem to be doing very well with the younger generations and why maybe some of them, you know, are, are leaving big law and going into the smaller law experience. Most definitely. And because really, again, what those younger generations have learned from the era of boomer ways, as an example, you know, it's about the experience, okay? And if you're not having fun along the way, what the heck are you doing? Yeah, you're just burning then, burning through your life without really having that passion and that enjoyment and that, you know, educational experience, whatever it might be that drives you. Uh, it's not, you know, if that's not in play, then you're just, you're just dreading every day. And th there are people that their lives are like that. And I'm, and I'm sorry for them. And I, I want them to change their practice area, their firm, their go out on their own, like make big, make big, bold decisions. Once you realize, you know, staying the course isn't, isn't the way to go. But that, you know, that's a big step to take responsibility for your life like that. Yeah. And yeah. it's hard to change yeah. too. Like you get pulled into a role and experience and a job where you're making, you know, 300 to 500,000 a year, you're, you've, you're, you know, you're, you're paying, you know, you get the big house and the cars and the kids yep. and, you know, and, and there's just and, and some of those folks, by the way, you know, living check to check or riddled in debt and they, they can't, you know, I know someone who makes a million dollars a year and, and there was a time where, you know, he was borrowing money, you know, because he just couldn't keep up with it. It's just some, you know, that's just, that's just kind of the way it goes sometimes. Um, well, I think that's one of the things, too, that people get caught up in the comparison game. Yeah. And the, the only comparison game you can win is, are you doing better today than you did yesterday? Yeah. There's always going to be somebody who is more of something. Right, right. You can't win that game. It's, no. it's yeah. Um, so how does, so let's, let's sort of like dive into then, how do organizations align five very different generations 
to be successful. I mean, with you've mentioned, you know, that setting expectations of of who to, you know bringing in the people that align with the with the values and the culture that exist. But what what are some of the things that, that on top of that that you would share? Well, it's it's them being true to them. It's you know you can put a lot of BS up on the wall. But it's really about then whatever you're committing to, living it. And if you say, look, we're going to be about family values and work-life balance, well, then you can't expect your people to work 60 hours a week. And you have to have a business model that supports both. Right. And if that's everybody makes maybe a little less, but everybody's a little happier, if that's really the agreed upon goal, then you get alignment. I mean, the, the, the most recent Gallup poll results as far as in level of employee engagement from actively engaged to actively disengaged. The actively engaged are the the exact opposite of the 23 behind you. It's 32% are actively engaged. 32, wait, so to clarify, 32% of the workforce are actively engaged in their jobs. Yeah, they're into their job, they're into their organization. Okay, okay. 16% are actively disengaged. Okay. Like, do not stand at the front door at five o'clock because you will get run over on their way. (laughs) It's like my 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 dog in the morning when he knows he's going to get fed. He almost knocks, he knocks over the cat every day. Exactly. And then you've got the (laughs) other quadrants. But, you know, right off the bat, you get two thirds of employees are not actively engaged. Yeah. And I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I, I really do think that organizations are not good about creating a vision that people want to buy into and be a part of. And then their cultures are inconsistent. They either don't have a good one or they state a good one, but they don't live it. Yeah. And they make all these exceptions and everybody then just looking for their exception because everybody else gets away with theirs. So they're not really true to what they say. When you find organizations that say and do on a parallel line, that level of engagement goes way up. So when you, when you're, well, okay. So you're working with a a company and you identify these issues, okay. um, That they're having and, and they come to you for your help. What are the two or three things that you, when you identify, they have these problems tell them and work with them on, on a day-to-day basis to get them to this place where they can be successful and have kind of a harmonious business? We start with the first two things, really, really defining a vision. And the okay. vision is not something you're doing today. It's something you aspire to achieve. Okay. Like I've worked with a, a client, a firm then, there were financial services and their vision was to impact a billion people. Not going to happen. That wasn't the point. The point was everybody in that organization, every time they touched somebody, that was an impact. And they were just out to do as, it had nothing. The vision said nothing about their financial services business. Right. Or about about, about the money that they were going to make or a goal that they were setting to hit. It was. Exactly. Right. The thought is if they impacted enough people, they'll get their share of business. Okay. So set, set a vision for the future, not a vision for a financial goal or for something exactly. that, that you want today. And if you, if you think you're making it big, make it bigger. Okay. That's what people will buy into this hope, this aspiration, being part of something versus just, yeah, we're here to make money. Big deal. That's not enough to move people's souls and get them motivated. And yeah. Then the other part is again, what, you know, without beating the dead horse, the culture side, can you be clear about it? Can you engage all of your people when you create this? We go through a process of, you know, getting, you know, as many of the players in the room and talking about the most important things and then whittling it down to the handful of most important concepts. It doesn't mean other things go away. It just says we move up to the top, the most important things. And if you can commit to those most important things and do your daily everything with those most important things in mind. Now you've got people that are aligned. They bought into this. And it's not just like picking a word like or a phrase. It's us getting to a common definition. If you have X number of people in a firm, and we're talking about, you know, we're gonna we're gonna act respectfully. We can't have everybody with their own little definition of what respect means. We have to come to our definition of what we're gonna use when we say respect. You get to that point, now you really have alignment. 
but it comes from the top down, meaning this isn't like a group conversation to figure it out. It's it's the person that's running the organization talking with you going through this. And then it's it's everyone needs well, to align I'll with tell that. You what, that's I think that's a good starting point. But if you want people to buy in at a better level, you want them part of that conversation. OK, that's where so, I was going. You know, the, OK, yeah. The, the leader may know ideally, but look, talking with your people, you may find that somebody has a little better idea. And you incorporate that. But mm -hmm. when you're asking somebody for their input and you actually use it, what's going to happen when you ask for their input again? They're going to play along. Yeah. And so now you have this team thing going where you're you're asking and you're using the information and you're incorporating the best. It's not about being the title and my idea. It's about the best idea and enga again, engagement of your people. Yeah. And the more people that are playing at that level, the more successful you're going to be. But I think this helps people that are running organizations, law firms in this case, and it helps employees who are working at law firms understand what they should be seeing or what maybe they're not seeing and, you know, realizing whether or not it's it th there's a similar shared vision because you want to be maybe at a place where what you're looking to get out of your life and your career and, and everything align with that organization. And if they don't, and you can figure that out, listening to this conversation, Phil, right, there might be an opportunity to, you know, get experience and, and move somewhere that maybe is more aligned. Or start your own and do it your way. Yeah. Well, I, I love that. I'm a huge fan of lawyers going out on their own and helping them, you know, get organized to, to do that in a way it's never been easier. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's never been easier. Um, because of all the technology and automations and things that are happening and virtual assistants and and you don't need an office. There's all kinds of great benefits to it. But again, that's not for everybody. Not everybody wants that life. Um, but it is a great option for for many people, more now than ever. So oh, I'll agree. Yeah. Hey, mm -hmm. Phil, listen, we got to wrap up. And, and everything that you've shared, I think, has been so insightful. And um, I just appreciate you and I appreciate you coming on the show. Let's wrap up with The Infinite Game, your game-changing book. Simon Sinek coming to coming to to battle again. This guy keeps coming up uh, like a not a what is it like a not a what's the what's the saying keeps coming up like finish the sentence uh, a rose <laughs> a rose in the desert maybe there you go anyway he's he's amazing I mean I like this book because it really you know hits at the heart of the matter um, and a, a you know a street level kind of example. I've done some work with a career resource center and you do a little presentation and you say, okay, who here is looking for a job? And everybody raises their hand. Then you say, okay, who here is looking for a career? And they go, ooh, I go, yeah, be careful of what you say you're looking for because you just might find it. And that infinite game is, are you playing the short game or are you playing the long game? And the long game is that vision that there's no end. It's not a place. It's continual continual improvement and continually going to achieve something larger. And that's what people will get excited about being part of. And so understanding what game are you playing? Yeah. Does the organization, you know, talk big and do little, or do they talk big and do big? Do yeah. they think innovatively? Do they take new ideas? Do they take chances or do they just talk the game and then take no chances? Right. Right. Well, excellent book recommendation there, everybody, uh, The Infinite Game. Um, let's take a moment to thank our wonderful sponsors. Of course, we've got PimCon coming up in September. If you're a personal injury attorney and you want to have an amazing experience you know, listening to some of the top players in the world uh, on stage and uh, teaching you marketing, do that. Um, Lawmatics, of course, helping with those automations for your law firm and getting staffed up. This opportunity to delegate to professionals um, down in South America that can take a lot of work off your plate. Phil, if people want to get in touch with you and they want to, you know, find out more about your coaching and Leap and all that, what's the best way to reach you? It's phil at leapcoaching.com or just website is leapcoaching.com. That's it. Wow. Thanks, Real man. Simple. Every Thank time, you. every time we get together, whether it's on this podcast or just individually, um, I always feel like I'm I leave smarter and better than I did when I got here. So, man, I just appreciate you so much and uh sharing your wisdom. And this is such an interesting. I know as soon as you brought up the five generations, I was like, I jumped all over. I was like, yes, let's talk about that and culture, you know, and all that. So um, thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate the time and the opportunity, Steve. You'll be well. 
Oh, always, always. Yeah, doing, doing well. Um, hey, everybody, listen, uh, whether, again, you're running a firm or you're working at a firm or you're looking to go on your own, you're on your own, whatever, you know, culture eats motivation. <laughs> what is it? Culture eats uh, strategy yeah. for breakfast, right? So um, think about not just building a law practice, but think about uh, how you're going to build a team and how you're going to build a culture that people want to be around and, and can can enjoy and be loyal to. Um, all things leading to being that lawyer, someone confident, organized, and a skilled rainmaker. I worked my way towards it, Phil. Um, have a great uh, week, everybody. Take care. Be safe. Be well. We'll talk again soon. Uh -huh.